Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. So I've been doing a series of videos focused on the North American transit market, especially in the next four years as there's a new administration in the United States and transit investment will hopefully go way up. So I've talked about what I think is a very high value project in the Penn Station and Hudson River tunnels upgrades. And I've talked about what I think is a very valuable project for regions in my regional rail video. I'll link them in the description. Today I wanted to talk about something which has not been talked about enough in the US, and it's the emergence of the second generation streetcar systems, as they seem to be called. These are the streetcar systems in cities like Detroit, Portland, and Kansas City. Now these aren't the only cities which have seen new modern streetcar systems across the United States. Over 10 cities have added these systems ever since their construction was largely enabled by Obama-era policies. Now, to be clear, I think streetcars are a great mode of transit, but the new US streetcars are full of flaws, and I want to point them out, because hopefully we can start doing streetcars right in the next four years. Now, on the whole, streetcars are a great form of transit, but these projects have a ton of issues. Now, I'm expecting we'll see more streetcars, and I hope that's the case. But if we're going to do streetcars right in North America and in the United States in particular, we've got to do a lot of things differently. I bring up Toronto a lot in comparisons with cities in the United States, and that's because it's a great comparison to make. Toronto's a large city, we have giant highways and car-centric sprawl, and we're very close to the US, so we're an easy example to point to. While Toronto experienced a lot of the same development trends as cities in the US, such as a reduction in the size of the streetcar network and a major expansion of highways, on the whole, Toronto's streetcar network was largely maintained. The reason this is so important to recognize is that Toronto's streetcars, while not perfect, present a ton of examples on where new modern US streetcars are going wrong, and I want to point out a few of them here. First of all, modern streetcar systems in the United States use kind of mediocre vehicles. While some vehicles, like those used in Kansas City, were manufactured by CAF just for the benefit of meeting Buy America standards. Now don't get me wrong, Buy America and these sort of policies often make sense, at least on a national level. But if it means you're going to be getting a worse product, then it's probably worth buying a product from overseas, or at least having a company from overseas come to the United States and build that product for you. Comparing the latest Toronto streetcar model, which has recently replaced the legacy fleet, to the models used in modern US streetcar systems, there are a ton of differences. First of all, the models used in Toronto are more accessible. They're also larger and seem to be more reliable. Using these modern vehicles has been a real boon for Toronto, and it's really transformed the way streetcars look, from old, clunky, large buses on steel wheels, to modern, low-floor trams that are not that different from what you see in Europe. Next up is network design. Remember those pictures I showed you of the systems in Detroit, Kansas City, and Portland? The routes are not that extensive. Portland has gone pretty far in building a number of streetcar routes, but compared to Toronto, none of the cities in the US are close. Now, I'm not trying to complain about these cities in the US. You have to start somewhere. But if you don't have a strong plan for expanding your streetcar network, which Portland, to be fair, has somewhat executed, then you start to see a lot of issues. Streetcars, by definition, are fairly inflexible, and so having a large network offers a lot of benefits. For example, in Toronto, when certain large events happen, sometimes streetcars can be rerouted onto parallel routes. This flexibility in the network allows them to operate a bit more like buses. A theme you'll see throughout this video is that if we treated our streetcar networks we're building a bit more like the bus networks we're building, or at least the bus networks we wish we had, we'd see a lot more benefit. Another issue I have to talk about is the layout on the street. Toronto's streetcars almost always land in the middle of the street, and now, on many new routes, streetcars are in dedicated median right-of-ways. Comparing this to modern systems in the US, where streetcars sometimes cross a number of lanes, or sometimes operate in curb lanes, you'll see that the Toronto streetcar has been fairly well optimized to minimize impacts on road traffic, and impacts from road traffic to the streetcars. One of the major issues with running streetcars in a curb lane, for example, is that you're stopped by right-turning drivers. In addition, it's often difficult to travel quickly in the curb lane, as the center lanes are generally where you're meant to travel quickly and traffic isn't coming in and out of side streets, and so operations in the center of the street probably make more sense. Stops on the Toronto streetcar's modern routes also feature full shelters and often other amenities, something which is lacking from some US streetcar systems. Next up is integration with the rapid transit network. While some US cities' streetcar systems are somewhat integrated within their rapid transit, this isn't the case broadly, and that's a huge problem. 
A streetcar that isn't integrated with the local transit system becomes much less useful. People can't easily transfer onto it from a bus or another form of transit, and this makes it very hard for locals to actually use the service. And it turns it into a bit of a tourist circulating route or something along those lines. Essentially, it's not acting as a proper transit service. Of course, integration goes beyond fares too. If the route isn't designed to enhance the coverage of the transit network, or if it isn't scheduled so that it aligns with other transit services, then again, it doesn't complement the regular transit network, and it becomes its own separate thing with separate intentions as well. When you consider integration of transit modes, Toronto does absolutely fantastic. And in fact, integrating transit modes is something Toronto does better than almost any other city in the entire world. For example, most streetcar routes end at a rail or subway station. Often, these streetcar routes will actually go underground, so that transferring between a subway route and a streetcar means you don't have to go outside and potentially get cold or wet. Something that's a huge issue in much of the US as well. Of course, in addition, streetcars are a regular transit fare. There's no difference between a bus fare and a streetcar fare. The integration with buses is strong as well. The Toronto Transit Network has been organized in such a way that streetcars and buses don't really compete on the same routes. So you don't have huge issues with being able to transfer from one mode to another. Perhaps the most egregious part of these modern streetcar routes is the service. The service provided often does not meet the standards of what we'd consider a good bus service. For example, streetcars often operate every 15 or more minutes and don't necessarily span a ton of hours in their service. For example, they might start late in the morning and end quite early in the evening. By comparison, in Toronto, streetcar service is incredibly frequent, at least by North American standards. While many cities across North America would die to have buses that are more frequent than, let's say, every 10 minutes, these type of frequencies are quite frequent in Toronto. And even at those frequencies, people in Toronto still tend to complain that our streetcars don't come as frequently as they used to. There used to be a kind of idea that there was always a streetcar in sight, meaning that if you just look down the street, you'd always see the next streetcar coming. In addition, core streetcar routes in Toronto run 24 hours a day, which means that there's no real difference between if you want to access your King streetcar at 9 a.m. in the morning for rush hour, or if you need to get home from a late night out at 2 a.m. This focus on frequency means that Toronto's streetcars are among the most used surface transit routes in North America. The King streetcar, which got a very famous pilot project that separated it from most of the automobile traffic on the street, led to the streetcar now carrying over 84,000 riders every single day before the pandemic. Those numbers on a single streetcar line are larger than many US subway and light rail systems and show just how powerful a well-implemented streetcar system can be. Now, a lot of the talk about modern US streetcars does come in the context of development. A lot of people see these new streetcars as largely being there as a nice train that you can point to and say, hey, developers, build a development next to this new route. Look at such a nice amenity. And to be honest, that's not necessarily a terrible attitude. Building transit often does drive development. The problem is that the focus shouldn't be building any transit so that developers will invest. The focus should instead be building high quality transit, which will inevitably still drive development, but will also drive high ridership and utilization as well. And having more people on the streets and using the transit route only means more potential customers for businesses and tenants for buildings. Of course, the issue with the development first approach that's often taken is that while it is often true that these routes do lead to more development, is that when development is the absolute focus, you forget about all the other important aspects of a transit service, like service frequency, network design, vehicles used, etc. Of course, in Toronto, we're not immune to this. We're building a number of streetcar extensions, largely constructed, perhaps negatively, to be reactive to new development. But we're also building a lot of lines to spur new development. The difference is that we still build these lines to high standards and will be operating high frequency routes on them. So it's not just a streetcar for developers, it's a streetcar for everyone. Now I should be clear too, streetcars are probably not the right answer in most cases. I made a video about streetcars versus buses previously, I'll link it up here in the cards, where I basically discussed where streetcars probably make more sense and where buses make more sense. And if your city's buses aren't operating at least every 10 minutes, then investing in streetcars probably doesn't make a lot of sense. For example, in Vancouver, BC, on the west coast of Canada, we have a bus route that carries almost as many people as many of Toronto's streetcar routes. Now, absolutely packing a ton of buses is probably not ideal, but running articulated buses and dedicated lanes, you can carry a ton of people on conventional buses and you don't get all of the negative headaches like the inflexibility and high cost of streetcar infrastructure. Of course, there are places in the US where streetcar networks make sense. Dense urban cores like Manhattan could definitely benefit from streetcar networks. 
And in addition, some cities like Philadelphia, who is modernizing their trolley network, could benefit from smart, modern approaches to streetcars or trolleys. At the end of the day, it's inevitable we see more streetcar systems being built across North America. But what's so important about streetcars is that we build them as high quality transit, not as development tools, but as high quality transit, because development will always follow high quality transit with the right policies. Thanks for watching the video, guys. I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.